بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين As was promised yesterday uh, Today we will look exclusively at the laws pertaining to Miras And uh, for those who uh, were not able to attend Or those uh, who have short term memory problems uh, we distinguished yesterday between mirath, waqf, and wasiyah, and quickly we said that uh, one of the key differences between mirath and waqf and wasiyah is that mirath is not discretionary. That these the, the shares are prescribed in the Quran, and uh, you do not have the option to uh, modify those sh those shares any way that you think is reasonable. And I say this because uh, <clears throat> uh, both scholars as well as governments have been trying to do exactly the same. Uh, and with good reason because, uh, <clears throat> you know, certain eventualities occur that are not adequately covered in the miras arrangements and so in order to to rectify certain injustices the effort is made the uh, yeah the effort is made to uh, to re-examine some of these verses but it's like a, a like a jigsaw puzzle if you take the one piece out uh it's not going to fit anywhere else it's you know it's well structured uh it's uh, it's uh, it's based the laws of miras are based on these verses. These are the primary verses. The verses of Surah An-Nisa, verse 11 and 12, for those who want to go back and look at them. And also Surah An-Nisa, verse number 176. This is the bedrock of the, of the laws pertaining to Miras. And, uh, and then you have the secondary verses. So the, the law itself is, when you look at it, it's structured based on these two, rule, two uh, verses of the Qur'an, uh, and then you have some ahadith, although ahadith surprisingly don't pay, play as much a role in the laws of miras as they do, for instance, in salah, or in psalm, and so on. They, they do not, where they do play a, a role is to, uh, to establish a certain, call it an infrastructure. So we have the, the infrastructure and the superstructure. The infrastructure and we'll talk a great deal about the infrastructure, which is not obvious in the verse itself. You look at those verses, you can't see it. For what you need is, 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 a, is a foundation, and, and that foundation is based on a combination of what Rasulullah taught us, but also what scholars have had to devise. So it's, 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 it's like a platform, and without that platform, the verses themselves don't work very well. So many of our you know, enthusiastic brothers and sisters go directly to the Qur'an in the hope that they would find uh, the answer in that, in, in that particular verse. And it, it, it never works like that, not with regard to miras or any other aspect. It's a combination of what, Rasul, what the Qur'an says, what Rasulullah taught us, what the companions have, have said, and what the scholars have, have focused on. So these four together give you Islamic law. And uh, the good thing about the structure is that you actually have more flexibility in the law because it's structured in this particular way. If, you, if it was focused purely on the, on, on the verses of the Quran, you're, you wouldn't have the, the latitude to interpret or restructure. You, you say, but because there is there is this gap that has to be filled with hadith material or scholarly interpretations, you that come a hundred years, a thousand years afterwards, you have that that latitude, you have that option to to engage in your own. Obviously, you know, if if you want to do br brain surgery, on the one hand, it's very easy. Every butcher is doing it. 
every butcher is doing it. And on the other hand, it requires uh, maybe 20 years of, of hard work and study. So the same applies here. Yeah, certainly, if you want to get to the verse of the Quran, it's right there. On the other hand, if you want to understand how those things fit together until we get to that complete jigsaw puzzle, that requires a great deal of training. Number two, not everyone who's trained in Islamic studies is trained in Islamic law. And not everyone who's trained in Islamic law is trained in the laws pertaining to miras. You need special expertise to do that. And so a good scholar will tell you that I can do this. I know that when I was a student, you know, we had in Dioband, we have the Darul Ifta where you give the fatwas from, which drive people crazy sometimes. Uh, you, uh, sometimes a fatwa would come to this scholar and he says, well, that's not my expertise. You have to go to him. Because that's, that's what he does. He focuses day and night on this. So they're, they're, if you go to a scholar and you are disappointed, then understand that it's because it's outside his area. He's not an expert in it. He's certainly not, he is certainly a scholar, but just not in that particular area. We need, we need multiple areas today. We need an entire area of scholarship that is very, growing very slowly, and that has to do with, with, with the human body. Surgeries, transplantations, artificial, objects coming into your body, automatons. There's a, it's a massive, complicated area. And I know that only from reading. I'm no expert on it. There's, uh, there, are, there are few non-alims who are involved in this, and they're doing a good job, but really we need to, to focus on that. And, and in every area you need expertise. Just in the area of, of, of uh, real estate, you need experts to help you with that as well. Because you want to, as a Muslim, you want to live within the, the, the umbrella of Islam. You want to live within that umbrella of Islam. And there's another thing I have to tell you before I continue. All, under, all practices of Islam have always been approximations. This is very hard for a Muslim to understand. I will, I will illustrate this by way of an example, which has to do, and I'm not going to touch on that now. We'll talk about that tomorrow, inshallah, the day after. Uh, Islamic banking, for instance. Very hot topic. We'll talk about that, but not today. I'm just giving that as an example. So the work done on Islamic banking is highly criticized because it says it looks exactly like a bank, and you know, this is not Islamic. Both sides, those who are not in favor of an Islamic banking structure will criticize it for not being Islamic, and those who, are, who want an Islamic banking structure also criticize it for not being Islamic enough. You understand? But there has never been anything Islamic that is completely perfect. That's hard for you to understand, but it's true. There has never been anything in, Islamic, in Islam that has been completely perfect. Uh, short of having Rasulullah standing right here in front of you and telling you, this is how it's done. Nothing else, is, it, they're all approximations. We all tried. Omar tried, Abu Bakr tried, Ali tried, Abu Hanifa tried, Malik tried. Everyone tries. Which is why you have these multiple schools. He says, brother, I disagree with you. The fact that he disagrees means that your model is incomplete. At least from my perspective. So I think this is how it should be. The other person says, no, I disagree with that. That creates its own problem. He says, why do we have multiple opinions? Well, because you have multiple human beings. And every human being has a particular perspective on it. You can't have it both ways. You want Islam to be rigid, and, 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 and uh, fixed, or you wanted to have a flexibility and a pliability. For that to happen, you have to accommodate multiple opinions. And who decides if a particular multiple opinion, of, of one opinion is the, the, the a correct opinion? Actually, you do. Based on your little understanding of Islam, but on your own circumstances as well. It is... Getting to what is right in Islamic law is 
requires a little bit of adjusting on all sides until you get there. And for the Muslim, you think, but I want to follow what Allah wants from me. That's exactly what Allah wants from you. That is exactly what Allah wants from you. So nobody, in my humble opinion, nobody's going to be taken to task. So why didn't you follow Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal? How? Given my resources, given the time available, given the people I know, it's very hard for me to do that. So I have done to the best of my abilities, I have come to this, reach this conclusion. This is, this is particularly clear in living in a country like America, where your imam would be Shafi'i, or the other one would be Hanbali, and the majority are Malikis, and you go off for Hajj, and if you've gone for Hajj in a group, when people ask me, I tell them, just follow the imam. It matters not what your school, school of law is. Yeah, you worship Allah to the best of your abilities. Not bad, MashaAllah. <laughs> yes. You worship Allah to the best of your ability. You worship Allah to the best of your ability. All right? So this is, these two verses are primary. These are secondary verses. Yesterday we spoke about the various uh, uh, stages that Muslims in Medina went to went through until they eventually got to this stage. These verses came afterwards, these verses came first. These are the verses that established these temporary relationships. You know, we said the brotherhood relationship. And the brotherhood relationship was not just, uh, it had legal ramifications. So if he died, he would inherit from him. Until there was this, this uh, this unfortunate incident with a person called uh, Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah. He passed away, radiallahu anhu. And when he passed away, his brother came by, and he had two daughters. When he passed away, his brother came by, and he, sh and he took the, 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 the property, he took the entire estate. So this, the wife, you know, this is, this is amazing. People have a sense of what is fair and what is not. She lived in that society, and what the brother did was not contrary to the, the ethics and the laws of that society. That's, that's what, that was the law. The brother would come and take away their estate. But she just felt from, maybe from, from the, the, the teachings that she had imbibed by way of Islam that this can't be. So she went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, Ya Rasulullah, Saad, went to war with you and he died. He said, Now his brother comes by and he takes everything away. I've got two daughters and I'm alone. How, what, how do I take care of this? So he says, Inshallah, Allah will provide a solution for you. Inshallah, Allah will provide a solution. I don't know how, how, how late it came or when it came, but that's when these verses came. You see, Allah fi awladikum. I want you to pay careful attention to this. Because we're living in a, in a, in a, in a culture right now, and, and uh, particularly amongst the lady, the, 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 our, our women folk, you know, th there's this disgruntlement, dissatisfaction that they're getting half what men are getting. Think about this time. They're getting nothing. They got nothing. They got nothing. Then this verse gets revealed, and there's, 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 there's an objection to it, to the verse itself. O on the one hand, when you, when you, when you get directions from the member about, you know, the, co the companions were, were very, very obedient and, 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 uh, and so on, that is true. But they, were also, they also pushed back. And their pushbacks are as interesting as, as it, all the other dimensions of, of, of Rasulullah's history. So they, they went to Rasulullah and said, yeah, this is, we're not happy with this. So what do you mean? He says, I mean, for instance, he says, Anu'ti sabi al-mirasu laysa yughni shay'an. 
So should we give a child inheritance? What did that child inherit? What, what, why does he deserve inheritance? See? So our perspective and their perspective is totally different. They lived in a culture where only those who were able-bodied, in other words, men, they were the heirs because they accumulated the wealth. You get the, the, the logic there. They fought the wars and they, they till the farms. They take, took care of the animals. So they were the breadwinners and therefore, this was the logic. They're not, they were not being unjust. In fact, in, initially these verses were being unjust to them because it was taken away from them until society stabilized. But their criticism to the verse itself was, do we give these people an inheritance when in fact they have no right to it? They may, they, you've made no investment in this inheritance. You'll be taken care of differently, but you're not in right. You see, you're being asked, you've been giving them the right to own property. It's not simply they're going to enjoy eating a pizza. This is not that. You're giving, and then that depends on what, how big the estate is. If it is a hundred acres, and there are two, two children there, they take everything. And so the guy says, but we fought so hard for this thing. So this was the basis for the criticism against, well, mild objection, we'll call it that. Should we give people children who don't inherit? So it wasn't just women. They objected to children as well. And so this particular verse was revealed and, and, and this changed everything. So Surah Al-Anfal and Ahzab and Nisa, they are the secondary verses. Your primary verses are the two and you can look them up. Any questions there? Yes, okay. yes. Repeat the question, please. Miras is the two-third portion that is mandatory to be divided into That's right, certain. that's right. I, I just want to clarify that, though. It is two-third if it is stipulated such. So if he dies and he doesn't stipulate one-third to be distributed in accordance with his own private agenda, then the entire thing becomes part of the miras. You understand? So you, ha you have to put that down on paper that, or you have to tell someone that I want one third of my, of, of, with witnesses of, of, of my uh, uh, estate to be given to the children's fund or something like that. Excluding, the, uh, excluding immediate family, those are already uh, mentioned. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Your one third cannot go to the, 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 the uh, stipulated or scripted heirs. Yes, it could be less than that as well. See, good questions coming today. The Suhoor must have been very good. Just one quick point I want to make here. In the Quran, if you look at the verse, it says, Min ba'di wasiyyatin yusi biha awdain. That's the verse of the Quran. We're talking about debts and wasiyya. We explained what wasiyya is, right? It's your, your private uh, allocation that you want to give to X, Y from the one third. But the Quran says, Min ba'di wasiyyatin yusi biha awdain. So you will give those, those stipulated shares that were in the verses previously, you would distribute that only after you have taken care of wasiyah and dain. Dain meaning debts. So the Quran reverses the order. The order of priority, in fact, is not according to the Quran. The order of priority is that you first pay off debts and then you deal with wasiyah. And the verse, if you listen, مِنْ بَعْدِ وَصِيَّةٍ يُوصِي بِهَا أَوْدَيْنَ And a very interesting reason the scholars say why that is. Because if there's a debt out there, somebody's going to knock for it. There's a wasiyah there, you want to keep it quiet, you don't want people to know about it. 
so that you don't, the 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 peop, the the heirs who are supposed to get that, you understand? You could very so. In other words, you must first make sure there is that there is no wasiyah. You might pay it afterwards, but you have to. That's the if if you are the executor, then you should find out is there wasiyah. Say all right now, take the wasiyah, keep it on one side. Let's first deal with the de debts, because the the debtors are all waiting. Janaza Salah is over, give him one day and they're waiting, they want to be paid. For the for the, for the Musa Ilay, it's it's he you wouldn't even know. I mean how 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 does the 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 the, the food bank know that that uh, someone has given them a hundred thousand dollars? So you have to be, you know, Alhamdulillah, we live in a society where where a paper trail is everything. So you, you have to write these things down. But and the verse is coming. Not, the verse is being revealed in a society that is unlettered. So if you have a wasiyah and you can't write yourself, so you always factor this in that these things are coming down at a time when there's no central bank, there is no bank, there are, there's no record keeping, there's no administrative structure. Uh, all of those things don't exist. So this these verses have to then uh, talk to you. In a, in, in a, to, a, to a society that is devoid of these structures, which we take for granted. But you know, make a note of it, send someone an email or something. Not in this society. With your signatures? Huh? Vasiya can be on a plain paper with your signatures, that will be considered a My advice to you, do it in a way that would, would, that would go through the legal system of this country properly. Because if you're leaving a substantial wasiya, somebody's going to challenge it. Somebody's going to challenge it. And uh, you don't want that to happen. Then your, your, your wealth is, is just held in abeyance until the court system deals with it. And you know how long the court is, right? So uh, there, you, you, you must be very, you must take, take the advice of an attorney, let them draw the stick, but nah. You know, today we we do have resources available, ready made, uh, so that you could do something that is pro forma and that can uh, then just be applied. Uh, the 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 ulama, the muf, particularly those who are involved in this, they they're very careful about these things. For instance, if you if if a mufti signs a fatwa, if you ask him, then he'll make certain if this is the last page, then his his signature will be very close to there. And when I was at, 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 at studying at uh, uh, Western law, uh, we were also taught that because you you don't want to give space for insertions here, <laughs> or you want to just scratch this off. You understand? So all of those things have to be taken into account. All of those things have to be taken into account. The debts. I just want to. We're going to get. We're getting to debts okay. now. Hold that. Hold that yeah. first until we. We're going to talk about debts now. So the, the debts, there are two kinds of debts. Haqqullah, haqq of Allah, and haqqul ibad. Okay? So you will have to extinguish those debts if they're haqqul ibad. That makes sense. Haqqullah means zakat, for instance. If you have outstanding zakat. According to three of the four schools, you have to pay the zakat. In other words, the executor has to pay the zakat. According to Abu Hanifa, he doesn't have to. And it's it's it. The whole argument hinges on ownership, and with ownership comes responsibility. When you die, you no longer own that that your estate. You still have the responsibility. But it is not a worldly responsibility anymore. Because your clock has stopped. There are consequences to what, 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 what you've done. But you have to weigh that with the, with the rightful owners of that particular estate. You, you understand what it is now? Ownership has passed. Because when you're, when you're gone, then really you own nothing. 
That's, that's a hard concept to, 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 to wrap your arms around. But you could be, you could be a, a multi-billionaire today. When you die, you, your estate goes to zero. You, sorry, not your estate, but your ownership goes to zero. It moves into an estate, and then that estate is distributed. That is the Hanafi viewpoint. The other schools say it endures. That this particular estate endures, and it can, it, it, it's a responsibility of the estate to deal with that, much like the debt is an, a responsibility. So that's, that's a small difference between the two or the different schools. Abu Hanifa school say no, and the others say, say yes, you have to pay the debt. All right? Huh? So which option we need to pick at the end of, among four school of thoughts? <laughs> Well, it depends on who's the deceased. If you're the deceased, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You're gone. You're in trouble, but you're gone. <laughs> now, if you've not paid your zakat in, in two, two, 2021, no, no, in 2021. Yeah, I mean, before you die, if you've not paid your zakat, it's a sin. I mean, well, okay. You completed your obligation. It's a fund. Yes. So. If your uh, children or who are your beneficiaries pay the zakat, does that absolve you? Or? Oh yes, you might you might be penalized for late payment. <laughs> yeah, but, but it would be better than <laughs> no payment <laughs> and full punishment. Uh, but, but you understand the balancing act here between, uh, and it all has to do with ownership and rights. Because once it transfers, then it belongs to someone else. And so, uh, going to taking that money from that person is is depriving them of what is rightly rightly theirs. And uh, okay, let's talk about assets and liability. Your so your estate comprises of your, like every other estate, your assets. And your liabilities, which is what we were talking about right now. So this is a liability. So you might have a, an estate of a million dollars, and your liabilities are, you know, five hundred thousand. Then you have to subtract one from the other. Basically, that's what it is. So it's estate comprises both of liabilities as well as assets. If I have a question regarding Hawk of Allah, yeah. other than zakat. If a person has missed his, you know, fastings for a certain number of days, he has to pay fidya, right, for that. So will that be also deducted from his estate? Uh, the other schools would allow that, but uh, but the Hanafis don't. It's kind of a side note. Uh, if you're a Hanafi, you know that you can, uh, that if you miss years of salah you can you can repay it right or you have, you're gonna re yeah uh, according to other schools you cannot do that for a very interesting reason for a very interesting reason uh, for Hanafis uh, what is the name of the t of we use there's a term they use for qadai umri there we go lifelong uh, outstanding salahs. You see, according to the honest other schools, this is very important to remember, according to the other schools, if you miss a salah de deliberately, you know what happens to you? You become a kafir. So let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> If you miss your salah deliberately, you become a kafir. If you die in that state, obviously, you know, the repercussions are serious. But if you make tawbah and, become, and, 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 and accept your, your, your error, then your clock is turned to zero. You get it now? Your clock is turned to zero. 
So God forbid you stopped making salah in 2010 and came to your senses in 2022 in, in the month of April, uh, then it's like you've become a Muslim in the month of April 2022. That's the logic. You get it? Any questions? No? The, not the Hanafi school. Hanafi school, you got 10 years of salah to, to pay, pay back. Yes? Wait, wait, wait. We learn that when you leave the salah, salah will be recovered even after the, the hereafter. So this is what we learn. But when you what? When somebody, now you're talking about somebody who's... Tariq al-Salah. Tariq al-Salah, yes. So uh, if he didn't pray for 10 years or for even one week, so um, he's going to... Either he's going to be uh, re recovering his salawat that he left... In his the, life. In his life, or... Uh, if he didn't, he's going to recover it in the hereafter. This is what we learned. Inshallah, hopefully it's that way. I don't know. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't come across that rule yet. <laughs> okay. Maybe that's the fifth ruling. I don't know. Jazakallah khair. So, So there are certain steps that you have to undertake. If some, somebody dies, let's just say you lost a loved one right now, and then you bury them tomorrow, and then by, say, next, next Monday, well, not actually, actually, before, you, before that, th this is what you do. This is your priority order. Let's call it that. One is what is called burial costs. Number two, we already spoke about debts. Number three is wasiya. So all the burial costs will come out of the will come out of the estate of the deceased. Followed by any debts that person might have had, and then finally the wasiya. Very simple. Don't need much explanation there, right? Yes, because the miras hasn't been given out yet. Although I see where you're going with this, because it, it, it links to our previous discussion about you know who, who carries that. Ultimately, we're not talking about people acting out of good faith. Look, out of good faith, the bro one son would say, I would take care of this. The other son would say, that's not the point here. The point is that legally speaking, in terms of the law, this is what it's going to be. Uh, this is how it will be done. practice when we bury someone yeah right as they close the graves next of kin next of kin will stand up and address the people saying Does he, if he owes any debts i'm here you can collect from me that's a, that's an islamic tradition actually uh, i've never seen it here but Th that's Pakistan. an islamic islamic tra they do <laughs> I, i've never seen it here. okay Well, it's all, it's, a lot of this has to do with culture. I mean, if, let's just say, you know, we have children here. And they go, they've been going to cemeteries. They've, they've never heard this thing. They're going to assume that it's, it's not a requirement. So if, un, unless it's, 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 it's put into practice. It, it, obviously, he's not going to the right ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, Imam, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Islamically, as per I, I, I have heard from scholars that uh, when somebody dies, the tarka has to be divided, you know, right away. So this notion of com where this notion came from, abhi to iska kafri mehdari wa tumne matlab wo jo hota na ke people are fighting for the miras. So is this a cultural thing or just came from? from it's cultural. It's cultural, and it can be easily contained. It can be very easy. There are lots of things that can be easily con contained 
if, if, if you have the right in the, the admin structure to contain it. I, I'm going to digress for one moment here. You know this triple tri talaq thing? <clears throat> you know the triple talaq, right? Which has which is caused enormous pain and suffering in, uh, throughout Muslim history. In, in, in the city where I spend most of my time when I'm in South Africa, Cape Town, people don't have this concept of giving talaq themselves. The ulama just didn't tell them. So you really have triple talaq hack taking place. Why? Because if you want a talaq, it doesn't occur to you that you can give you. Now it's changed thanks to Mr. Google. So now people know that, well, I, I don't have to go to an alim to do this. Whereas previously, they'd have to go to a sheikh, and the sheikh would stop them right there and says, okay, let's rewind. Why do you, you understand? In other words, the whole process, which should have been there in the first place, counseling and, and getting both families involved. and So it, they would go through the entire... So by that time, you, then, you, then you have controlled the, the, the whole situation. But now you empower people and, and you do this, it, it gets out of hand. In the same way, if, if the uh, scholars put, it, put a practice in place that as soon as somebody dies, you, the, the, the scholars will take control of the estate or they will get involved and tell you, all right, you come on Monday there will be a meeting. And here's a date, come into the office, and we will settle it there. The last thing you want is for this thing to be settled in someone's lounge or family room because the loudest voice is going to prevail there. It often happens that, you know, the, especially in our structures, the big brother has got the loudest voice and people are out of deference to him and fear and ignorance. They respect him, they're scared of him, and they don't understand the law very well. They give in to him. It never occurs to them that he may be misreading the law or abusing it. So, you know, the idea is to get a third party involved which, and, and, and someone you can trust. Even at, uh, you have a group of attorneys and you just tell the attorney, that you take control of this, here is the, the, the requirement in terms of Islamic law, this is the estate, and this is how it's going to get distributed. So that, that, would, that would get rid of this problem. Okay. Now we come to the actual shares themselves. Uh, this is a very interesting structure, and very different from, 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 from Western law, because Western law is very simple. Very, very simple uh, compared to, is, to Islamic law. Uh, in Islamic law, you have categories, and those, those categories, they, are, they work like this. You have the first category would be of heirs. Now we are coming to, the, to actual distribution. You have the man is buried, his, co his expenses uh, or his liabilities and debts have been taken care of. And now we're left with the shares. So you have the first shares group is called the Quranic shares or the Quranic uh, heirs. Let's call them heirs. All right. Uh, also called Ashabul Furud. I'll just write that down. <sighs> and then you have the Asaba. These are the remnant heirs. We'll explain that now. And then we have a, 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 we have a, a circle, a cycle, or a return. It's called return to the return to one. Let's call it return to one. I'll explain that to you now. And then we have the uterine relatives, mother's side, mother's. Uh, let's not use that. Maybe it's so the Quran mentions certain groups of people who who should be given a, a, a share. 
انما الصدقات يوصيكم الله في اولادكم لتذكروا الحمد في حظ الانثيين فان كنا نساء فوق سنين فلهما ثلثا so you know various people so in that is for, for instance mothers fathers daughters they are all fall into this category of quranic heirs your fard is your share these are the these are the companions of the shares so they are this this is what happens you so if this is the estate if this is the estate then these people are given first shares and whatever is remainder goes to the the, the asaba a a a s a b a asaba the the remnant shares that is your fa your 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 son your brother your uncle but they come in the second second category not the first category daughters come in the first category sons come in the second category so when you put all this together then you find it some very interesting dynamics taking places in the way they change so you have the 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 ashabul qurud then you have the asaba then you have the return to you see what happens is <clears throat> so when you if you if you have distributed if you've given one this share and you've given two this share this is what remains right that which remains will return to one again that that's how it works so you you start by allocating shares to one first then to two and then if you still have leftovers whatever remains goes back to one according to those to their to their allotments okay no kalala is different it is kalala simply means somebody who's got no ascendants and descendants so it is not it's not a big category anyway so here, here do you do you want to show you, you got that? what's your question so you would have shares being given to the quranic heirs no that they might not cook exhaust they might they might not in most cases one and two would exhaust the entire but you do have cases where they do not so they're given they they're given a particular share so mo- mothers and fathers are given a particular share daughters are given a particular share and they all fall into this category that and their total the total value of that sh- of the share that was allotted to them takes up this portion then the sons would would take up this portion here the wife or oh, the wife is here the wife is right on the top the husband is also on the top not necessarily not necessarily in fact I'll, we will do we will it's going to get more complicated so you go from 1 to 2 then if it doesn't exhaust you go to 1 again if it doesn't exhaust then you get the outside relatives involved if it doesn't exhaust you can go you go further down and you go further down until you get to the last category which is the baitul mal so if he dies no wife he tried but no wife no kids parents there's no one around him only in that case when he's gone right down here at the bottom they didn't go to the baitul mal <laughs> no inshallah that's not the case <laughs> Yeah, so you get it now. So it's 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 a uh, think of, of a line of people standing in front of you. Here, here's the disbursement. Here, the money is here. So pe- you know you would 
form these lines and they would come. But you'd be like, you know, group one and group two, and then if group two, two is finished and you haven't exhausted the funds, then you, group one comes in again, and so it goes. Some of the categories are very, very interesting. Uh, so you have one category here. It doesn't apply today, but it. it I, I want to bring it out to, to, to simply uh, bring attention to to the concerns that Islam had in terms of social reform. You have you have one category here called the the the. Master who freed, well, not the master. Let's be one who freed a, the slave, not a slave, but the slave. So, I'll give you an example. Aisha radiallahu anha had a slave, and she freed the slave. So the, the person had full rights. Then that person died. And that person had some material left over, some stuff. So obviously they went through this whole process until there was no one available. Then because she freed the slave, she inherits from the slave. See? So obviously you talk, you're living in a society where slavery is, is, is part of that social structure. Uh, and if you, if you study the history of, of slavery, then you would know that you, know, you had uh, domesticated slaves and you had chattel slaves and you had uh, commercialized slaves and so on. So there are very cat various categories of, of slaves. And... Uh, and Islam had its own way of dealing with this. I, we're not talking about slavery here, but I will quickly focus on that. Uh, the one that you're familiar with that is that uh, that the freeing of a slave is 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 an option in your kafara or your expiation. You know that, right? That you know you can do this, you can do that, you can do that, or you can free a slave. And but that that obviously did happen. But what happened more often is that you had a a slave who was sla who was freed on two two, uh, two other ways. One was called a mudabbar, and the other one was called a mukatib. So, the the slave master would, because of his relationship with the slave over the years, very cordial relationship. Uh, uh, he would then make an announcement that uh, let's just say his name is Abdullah. Abdullah, who uh, he is hurrun bad dubra um mauti. That's where the word mudabbar comes from. That Abdullah will be will be automatically freed as soon as I die. So that was one way in which s slaves were were, uh, were were freed. And the other is if the slave was was uh, skilled, and he was able to sell his skills somewhere. So you know this guy he could he could uh, he was a good coder. He was he did coding very well. And he, but he was a slave, and so he told his master, "I will find a job uh, and do uh, work in the computer industry, and I will pay off whatever amount you th you think is appropriate." So that was a mukatib. In other words, he had a an agreement, a written agreement, that allowed that slave to be freed uh, on on on, fulfil ful on fulfillment of that contract. So this slavery is 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 an inherent part. Of our tradition, and uh, it it uh, it's uh, the tone in the in, in Islam is that it's it's something that should be abolished. But understand that the uh, the abolition of slavery required a particular change in the economic structures of the world. Otherwise, it would not have happened. Europe and America, certainly, especially Europe, certainly did a great deal in abolishing slavery globally. 
but the means of production had changed by then. And a slave-based economy was no longer viable. Think about it. This is, happens around when, when what, what is coming into place? Machinery. Machinery. So s slaves then become a liability. Slaves become a liability. So w without taking away from, from what they've done, uh, and and what they've done is 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 uh, admirable, and 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 I and and, and uh, I I I would always bring attention to that, but you have to also put that in context that this take can't could have taken place in the 18th 19th century, in Europe in particular, and and the European if you understand the Euro European um, mercantilist economic system, uh, they could no longer afford keeping ha having that kind of it's, it's like. It's like the modern equivalent of, you know, we need, we have uh, self-serving uh, uh, these uh, checkout places. Now you don't have to hire anyone anymore. So, all right, you can go. In, in, uh, in seventh century Arabia, eighth century Middle East, 10th, 12th, we never had that option. So the economy was dependent on slave. The slave, slave provided asset value, and so therefore you kept the slave. But there was always this, this, refra this refrain in Islam that a slave is ideally freed. So going back to when, wherever slaves started of, of Prophet Muhammad's time, uh, did they, they acquire slaves? How did they really, was this from someone who was um, just bought, like they have seen in movies or some places? Well, well or how did they that's a good them? question. And, uh, and did they pay them also and did they just use them for labor? Okay. There's a slavery that is that is that takes place at, up to the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then there's slave laws as found in our text, and then there's slavery as practiced by Muslims. The three are totally different. The slavery that existed at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the slavery that was rampant in the entire world. It's not something unique to Arabia. Everyone was engaged in slaves nor is it unique to Africans. They were Europeans who were enslaved. The only slavery Islam allowed after Islam was enslavement because of war. As an act of mercy, how's that? As an act of mercy. You say, how could that be? Well. You know, some of you come from places where you still live, where people still live, live these rustic lives. Think about those people. So you have this small little town, little village, Gao, there in the Punjab, or down, down there on the reef area, of, right? And so the people from one town attack the people from the other, and they, and they defeat that, those people. What are you going to do with, with, the, with, with the prisoners of war? What are you going to do with the prisoners of war? You have two options. You can leave them where they are, they will die slowly. Or you can kill them. Or you can absorb them into your, into your own household. How do you absorb them into your own household? As equal citizens having the same rights and, 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 and responsibilities? You can't possibly do that. Think about the challenges we face here in this country with immigrants, with refugees. Even the kindest amongst us draws a line at some place and says, well, you can't treat them entirely like you treat the locals. And we have the resources to absorb them. In fact, we have a labor shortage in this country. We can easily absorb a lot more. So what if one tribe is just attacked another tribe and has defeated that tribe, which to all intents and purposes meant that that tribe no longer exists anymore? What happens to the human beings who live in that, in, in that tribe? What happens to their rights? So they were given certain rights. They were absorbed into the, in, into the household. They became part of the household. It's not a pleasant thought, but it's a human reality. It is a human reality. If you have one, one more question on that, I'll take it. That's it, no more. No, no thank you, MashaAllah. 
The other one is the wasiyah which we have already spoken about more than once and the, th and the third is the Baytul Mal which is where the wealth will go to. If we're done with that we can move on to the next section which has to do with those who are debarred from for some reason or the other from, uh, from uh, inheritance. No. No? No. Okay. I'm just giving you an, or, or, an or <laughs> outline. Okay. You normally, this thing takes about, it takes at least three months. So what are the impediments to inheritance? Let's call it that. And many of these are more uh, pertinent to our society today than they may have been in the past. This one obviously is not, and we've spoken about it, slavery, and by that is meant what? That if someone is enslaved, this is what happens. So, a war takes place. You, you know, Rasulullah had a slave, right? His name was Zayd ibn Harisa, radiallahu anhu. And he was, Rasulullah was not involved in that war himself, but they wa a war took place. Well, this, this one way was war, the other was just simply going out and grabbing people. So he was enslaved in that way, and he was brought to the, to the city of Makkah, and Khadija actually bought him. And then she gave him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So you, you understand the chain now? It, it becomes part of your assets. And uh, so if, if, Ras if uh, Rasulullah passed away, he could have given, let's just assume, that he could have given Zayd, and Zayd was still a slave, None of that applies, but I'm just hypothetically speaking. Then Zaid would have gotten from Rasulullah's one third, which is his personal endowment. But he could not inherit from Rasulullah. For the basic rule that an, a, a slave is an object, he's not a subject. A slave is someone you buy and sell. He doesn't have the right of ownership. He doesn't have the right of ownership. So if you give it to him, you're in fact giving it to the to his, you know, whoever is his owner. So that's 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 the problem with that. The other is uh, killing. This is a very interesting one. If you are in any way responsible for the death of the uh, deceased, then your right to your inheritance is problematic. And uh, this, this can happen. On the one hand, premeditated. Let's call them the Menendez brothers. Remember them? You know, where there is this premeditated uh, killing of the father and the mother. Or it's just a father, I don't know. Uh, that's on the one side. On the other side, subhanAllah, you're driving dad home one day and somebody knocks into you. It's the passenger side. And dad is gone. You were driving the car. So you're instrumental in his death. So what do you think you're gonna should you get be given a share or not? <laughs> See? Menendez brothers easy. This one's problematic. And you see how easy this can happen, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. The problem with, what is the problem with the intent? Intent is not obvious. That's the problem with intent. Intent is not, in other words, you know, I don't know what your in intentions are. It's not obvious. So a, a, a judge cannot rule based on, he can try and determine intent by looking at, 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 at the circumstantial evidence around him. That's how they determine intent. But pure say, in other words, you simply say, I didn't intend to do that. Well, that's where the whole thing comes. So let's talk about what the scholars say. So now, now you understand when, when you have a Shafi, Abu Hanifa, Malik, they're not 
just breaking up the Ummah into four pieces or ten pieces and so on. These are real issues. If I have to ask you to desert, write it down now, you come up with ten different opinions on this. You will have ten different opinions on this. And why? Because you're humans and you can think creatively yet separately from each other. What you can see, he can't see, and vice versa. That's, that's, that, that's, that's the, 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 uh, the yield of our collective efforts. Eh? So he says that uh, so Malik rah rahimahullah says you, ha if you can show culpability then he would not inherit. Obviously the, the highest form of culpability is premeditation where you know you actually got an email that says let's kill him tomorrow or something like that. And the other is to say that any the, 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 what's, what is called the, the, the uh, uh, the test of the average person. If there's a car coming along at 50 miles per hour, would the average person turn in, 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 in the path of that car? He wouldn't. He wouldn't. So there you would say, no, well, you're culpable. Normal human beings don't act that way. Normal human beings. So that's Malik's view. In, in Islam, we have two, two types of, uh, uh, in, in the case of accidental death, this is a, a, a category that's at the bottom. In the case of, well, let me, let me explain this to you. In Islam, you have, if, in terms of murder, there, there are three categories. Uh, there is uh, premeditated, al-qatl al-amad. Then you have shibh al-amad, which is culpable, culpability. And the third one is khata. So khata is a mistake, right? It's just a terrible mistake. And here, it's, yeah, yeah, a reasonable person would have acted otherwise. And the third is premeditation. And uh, so, so when the scholars are, are just are talking about who is in, entitled to inherit or not, they're looking at this framework. So you understand what they're doing, right? The, this was already there. This says, well, we'll take from that and says, if, if, in the case, sorry, in the case of, of premeditation, even in premeditation, if you kill someone, then there are two, like in our legal system in this country, there are two parts to all, all cases, right? There's the trial part, and then there's the, Sentencing part. So the trial part will be done by the law, by the courts themselves. In the sentencing part, in our legal system, in the sentencing phase of, 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 of the trial, the me members of the family have the right to make their comments. They have the right, in other words, to influence the judge. In the Islamic system, they have the right to even absolve that person of, of, of the crime. Or if, if they want entirely, or if they want, he says, well, we understand the situation, uh, but we would like blood money. So they would want to be compensated. They call it blood money because it's, you know, it's blood money because of, of that murder itself, but also because, you know, you'd have 100 camels or 200 camels or something like that. So that's, that's where the word blood money comes from. So th that particular framework then gets transferred onto this side. So Abu Hanifa says, if this is a murder that warrants blood money, then he can inherit. Anything above that, he cannot inherit. Because the hadith says, لا يريث القاتل. The killer will not inherit. He says he will not inherit. Under no circumstances. So you understand the three, three viewpoints. The next one has to do with, many rulings have come about, religious differences. So, you know, right? And the basic rule in Islam is that a Muslim must, cannot inherit from a non-Muslim, 
and a non-Muslim cannot inherit from a Muslim. That's the, that's the, 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 the basic uh, rule, grow, but you must understand that, that basically that is the rule. And from there you have multiple opinions. Some have tweaked it and says a Muslim can inherit from a non-Muslim. Okay, if it works in favor of the Muslim, but not if it, not, if it does not. But generally, mo all the scholars have adhered to the rule as stated in the tradition that in this country in particular, but the scholars in this country uh, have worked a lot, uh, very hard on this thing because it's, you know, there's so many, and, and, they, and they have parents or brothers and sisters and so on. So that not. If category of? Of wife. Even though, there's this, then you have the third category, which is, uh, I forget now, my mother's non-Muslim. And so, uh, now you see how the... Exactly, exactly, that's a good point. Children, you, Islam allows you to marry someone from... The, you can certainly instruct the child. It's a very bad idea. It's a child hearing and, and in turn only. But keep your representation of Islam. So you have to pray five times a day and just the salah. Only you 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 have to you have to very great likelihood. Right example. You don't want the child to follow what you say. That you want the child to follow at his father or his mother as being the representative. I won't do it. So these three imp very re important requirements in my house, for as long as at least Islamically, for the. But if not, I, I mean, the train has left the station by Absolutely. the time they get there. Absolutely. So we should not underestimate the challenge we face. And it depends on how we behave, not how we teach or preach. That's the most important thing. Teaching and preaching will only get you that far. You want a child to remember, forget about the wealth, you're going to leave that child. It's not important. Not important. Then you've accomplished a lot. The rest of it is irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Of, of his or her time with peers, then the, he spent eight hours of time with You're parents. right. I mean, you, it's exactly the same thing you, that he's telling me that uh, right. there's nothing we can do about it. Here, we've come to live here. We live, mashallah. You know, we, th we think the Arabs are rich in, South, in, in the oil gulf, gulf state. They're not. Our standard of living is much higher. Therefore, we need more respect. I have to tell you categorically, it doesn't. Islamic school is good. I had, I had a student many, many years ago in this masjid who did his master's thesis on, on Islamic schools. So caught up in, so, mashallah, he's done a great job. And he's done so many good things. But I want him to do this. Because Islamic school is not a, is not a silver bullet. Mm. Not what you teach the child in terms of do's and don'ts, but in what you reflect in your qualities as a Muslim. How many they have I, not produced? I have, I, in transferring your responsibility of raising a, a wholesome child by way of that Islamic school? No. Islam, no. There's no training ground for, a va for values in an Islamic school. Understand that. Those teachers are there from A to B, and they're there primarily to teach you the, the facts and figures of Islam. The do's and the don'ts. They people and in Islam that speaks the truth, they can, I know I'm putting a huge burden on you, but man, you've come to this country, I'm talking about myself as well, we've come to this country and this is our challenge. At this stage, even if you were in other countries, the same influence of yeah, the peers yeah. is there. Although, although they, they, your argument is more valid that you live, when you live within an Islamic culture, it's very hard for you to just, just disassemble your Islamic identity. Is
You're not there yet, right? You have a question? No? Okay. So we've done apostasy. Then we come to what is called man and hajab. Let me, let me just uh, put a circle on here. So this is the deceased, right? And then you have parents, uh, better still not parents, but father, and then upwards, grandfather. And then you have uh, son, a uh, uncle, sorry, uncles. They all fall into that previous category that we spoke about, most of them. Asaba, remember we used the word asaba? Uh, you know you have this word that's common in Arabic as well as Urdu, it's called ta'asub. It's, it's a feeling of empowerment, that's where the word comes from, ta'asub. Why? Because you have people around you, that's where it comes from. Wa nahnu usba. You know, I have ten sons, or I have ten brothers, and so on. So that's where the word asaba comes from. So anyway, when somebody dies, then these are his, his agnates, his, his male relatives. Father, grandfather, brother, uncle, son, grandson. These, this father is taken care of by way of the first category. Remember we said that if you, there's some things you must go away with. One of them is that they, they are these categories. Quranic category, then you have the brotherly category, and so on. So the father is actually falls into that Quranic category. The sons and everyone else fall into the second category. But they don't fall into the category equally. So how do they fall into the category? They fall into the category of first the sons, then the brothers, then the uncles. What do we mean by that? If, unlike in that, in that other circle I gave you, there's going to be a leftover. There's no leftover here. If this disease has sons, brothers get nothing. If this disease has no sons but he has brothers, uncle gets nothing. You see? So you, un you understand that the, 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 the structure is, is, is embedded within the tribal structure of Arabia as well. And you can see that reflected in this. So this is, this is, it was under, this is a, the, the priority list. Uh, or, or, this is called mana. The other is, Wait, yes, oh. if, even if he, has, if he has just one son here, and he has five brothers here and ten uncles, he gets everything. That's right, because the daughter's share is stipulated. She gets one third under certain circumstances, she gets one sixth under different circumstances. If these people are not around, then she goes, remember we said you go back again? Then the daughter gets again. There are situations where daughter gets everything. There are such situations. To come back to our previous discussion about waqf and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, imiras, you have this, and this is where Egypt in particular has actually taken a, a, a stand on this. Uh, and I think it, it, it was not, it, anyway, uh, it's, this is what it is. So you have two sons. Then you have grandsons. But this one dies. So what happens in that case? The son takes everything. You understand? So someone dies, he leaves two sons, one son dies, the other son remains. This son, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So in this uh, circumstance, the other brother or the other son get died. The deceased, yeah. Yeah. May it now. So in this case now we're gonna go back to the wasiya. So well, if what if he didn't leave wasiya? Yeah. If it, there is no wasiya means Nothing. the grandson will <laughs> So what Egypt has done is they've taken this grandson and pushed him up here. Okay. You understand? 
Now guess who's complaining now? Yes. The son, this son and this grandson is complaining. Because in terms of ranking, these two are the same. But obviously, they're not doing it for, 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 for negative reasons. They're doing it for a good reason. But what, which is why my suggestion was, if you want to address situations that cannot be addressed by way of miras, you might as well take the option of the waqf. The more ease, you have more flexibility there. Because if you start messing around with this, I, my analogy of the, of the, of the uh, jigsaw puzzle is, is, I think, quite apt. You take the one piece out, there's no other, you can just can't put it back again. L last comment, last comment about the wasiyah. Wasiyah can be uh, given the whole wealth for the, for the grandson. I mean, the one same third, amount? One third. Only one third. One third. Okay. Only one third. Okay. Huh? Where's the, where's the? So one third for the grandson in this particular case, but then. Uh, but it, 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 but, it would but not the man apply. is dead already. How's he going to give the one third? Yeah, no, 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 not one third. I'm saying the comment came that uh, you can do in the wasia from the one third that you have the choice. Yeah. To. But I, I thought that you could not because this yes, grandson yes. would Good come point. to that other category. You, 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 well, in this case, in, in this case, he will not. Inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow.